thanks for coming out for this. Um, in any of these presentations, questions are very appropriate. Um, the orchid family is one of the largest families of flowering plants, and you know, obviously, we're not going to cover the whole family and actually cover a very tiny part of the family, but um, focus just on hardy orchids and primarily three that are uh, the ones most readily available and the ones you're most readily to succeed with in the garden. And they are um, Latilla, and we'll meet all of these. Uh, Cypripedium, which are the um, lady slippers, one of the uh, genera that have the common name of lady slipper. And um, Calanthe. We'll meet these in the garden. And on our way out to the garden uh, to see some examples, if the if greenhouse five is not too terribly busy, we might step in there because there's actually quite a few of the lady slippers with flowers today. There's a real pretty specimen out in the garden um, because the different species and hybrids don't all bloom at the same time. There are some that are now done blooming, but there's one that's just perfect. Well, it's perfect yesterday, but I think it I think it'll still be fine. Okay, well we can get started. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. There are a lot of distractions, yes. All of the lady slippers are on this far bench and we can go in and you know just view them and then we'll go back out to the garden. The uh, lady slippers in the genus Cypripedium occur in um, North America, quite a few species native to North America, quite a few species native to uh, Asia. There's also a few that are native to uh, Central America, Honduras and I think Belize. Um, in here and in the garden we have some that are wild species and some that are man-made hybrids. Um, and they all vary in their difficulty to grow. Um, you know, this, this is one that occurs locally. I've known of a, a plant, not a planting, but a wild population of this, a small one in Durham County for 40 years that was still blooming this spring. This is um, the little uh, yellow lady slipper. It's Cypripedium parviflorum. Used to be lumped with the European yellow lady slipper, which looks almost identical. Um, but this is one of the wild lady slippers that's quite easy to grow. Um, you know, the, the local lady slipper that you're most likely to see is the pink moccasin flower. Don't even think about transplanting it. You are not going to succeed. Nobody succeeds. Just leave it, enjoy it in the wild, um, and you know, grow something like this or one of the hybrids, which with a reasonable amount of care you, you should succeed with. Um, the cypripediums are woodland plants. Um, I wouldn't put them in a really dark shady place, but a, a brightly shady space place, maybe with a few hours of sun but certainly not a full sun location. Now, uh, this is another wild species, and I believe it occurs up in the, uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, but not down in the Piedmont or the coastal plain. And this is one I would not recommend for this area unless you're like a real serious orchid grower, because it really wants a colder climate. I remember being in I think Ohio in the spring, and you actually saw it on the edge of woodlands in, on the roadside. So where it occurs naturally, it's quite a vigorous thing, but it wouldn't uh, succeed in this area. Um, you know, it, 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 its native range, I think, extends well up into uh, Canada. Um, and then the, the rest of these, let's see, yeah, you can come on down. The rest of the, these are um, man-made hybrids, somebody, you know, intentionally hybridizing the different species. And, you know, the catalog has a lot of really useful information and usually indicates whether one of these is a, one that's easy to grow or more difficult to grow. But gen in general, the hybrids are fairly easy to grow. And um, these plants are at least seven years old, which is why they, you know, fairly pricey but um, if you have the right conditions um, you know they, they get, will get better every year every year they will tend to have more stems and then therefore more flowers okay.
Any questions yeah, on any of these guys? Some of the other orchids will um, um, talk about, t well, the Calanthes are on that bench, but we'll see them out in the garden and it'll be quieter out in the garden. And then the Blatillas are in greenhouse four, but we'll see some examples of them in the garden. We'll go back out this way. Okay, um, a different genus, Calanthe. Um, this is an example of the beautiful foliage of Calanthes. Um, the lady slippers are all deciduous, and I, I know we tend to think of deciduous in terms of woody plants, but you know, some herbaceous perennials, plants that lack woody stems that live from year to year, are evergreen, you know, like hellebores are evergreen, liriope is evergreen. Um, but the lady slippers are deciduous, but the calanthes are um, evergreen, provided we don't go below 15 degrees. Now, if the foliage gets burnt off, it doesn't hurt the plant because um, this foliage only lives a year. It's produced in the spring, and um, this was all. This is all this year's new foliage, um, and so last year's foliage would be dying off naturally anyway. So if the if we have a cold winter and the foliage gets burnt off, the plant is not affected by that at all. Uh, you know, from a garden maintenance -ish standpoint, you probably want to cut away the old foliage just because it looks uh, a little untidy. So the calanthes are quite easy to grow. Well, I should say, um, calanthe is a big genus. It's like somewhere between two and 300 species, and the majority of which are tropical. But the ones that are winter hardy, uh, um, in this climate are quite easy to grow and I enjoy their foliage year-round or at least until you know we have to cut it off in the winter or early spring. Um, they're mostly done blooming but a few more steps this way there's one that um, still has some flowers so you can start to get a uh, idea of what they look like. I have a quick oh, yes please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, the lady slippers we just looked at were in really deep um, pots, and the question was, do they have a taproot? They do not have a taproot. They have fairly thick, fleshy roots, and the planting of the lady slippers is a little bit more exacting than most other things. Um, in the wild, the roots wouldn't be so much in the mineral soil, but more in the duff layer, the rotted leaf litter on the surface of the soil. So when you plant those lady slippers, you would you know, dig a normal hole, but then spread the roots out just below the surface of the soil and then always keep a good layer of rotting organic matter on top. It could be anything. It could be this hardwood mulch like we use. It could be you know, the trees, uh, the leaves from the trees. Um, but a lot of woodland plants end up with most of their roots in that duff layer rather than in the soil. So it, when you took it, take it out of that pot, you'd probably take all that potting mix off and just you know, spread the roots out. The uh, calanthes and the blatillas, you, know, you can just plant that like most other herbaceous perennials, just you know, in the regular soil. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's, there's probably a common name for calanthe, but, uh, you know, the, the, the scientific name calanthe means beautiful flower. Uh, when, where, cala the, the, is from the Greek for beautiful and anthe is flower, so, you know, I've sort of never worried about a common name for it. And this is a um, wild species calanthe. This is calanthia discolor, and discolor sounds like discolored, like something's discolored, but the di just means two, and it, you see it's two color. It's sort of a red-brown and then with a white lip. Um, Lydia is recording this, so 
she'll have proof that I removed a flower from the garden, but, um, um, you know, in, in a, the orchids, orchid flowers are highly modified. The outer whorl are actually sepals that look like petals. And then um, several of the petals become the lip, and in the lady slipper it becomes the pouch. But a typical orchid has, um, you know, like three sepals, and then I guess, yeah, three sepals, and then one true petal, and then the other pe two petals are fused into the lip. And a really curious thing about most orchids, in bud, uh, the bud flower orientation is that way but as it opens, um, it turns downward. And that is characteristic of almost all orchids. So the few orchids that don't do that are called um, resupinate. But um, th these are really um, easy orchids. Um, you know, if you can grow hostas or most ferns, you can grow calanthe. Um, and when a clump get, gets thick, you can dig it up and divide it. And when we are looking at the blotilla, I'll show you an extra little um, technique to increase your uh, rate of reproduction. You see, we haven't cleaned up last year's leaves, but they're naturally just going, you know, dying because that's their life cycle. They, they, they do have foliage through the winter, but the foliage only lives for one year. Um, there are several species we grow, Calanthe, discolor. There's also a lovely form that instead of um, red-brown sepals and petals, they're lime green with the white lip. It's real pretty. And then Calanthe seaboldii, named for a German with the family name of Seabold. It's a more robust plant in bloom. It's about that height and the flowers are a bit bigger and they're bright yellow. And then there's a series of um, hybrids that um, are also really worth growing. Questions on any of that? You know, and you, you see this is full shade location. When the sun's higher in the sky, there'll be brighter filtered light. It's growing with a, several different epimediums, which, you know, if, if you know the epimediums, you know they're definitely shade plants, a hosta. And uh, this primrose back here, Primula seaboldii, you know, again, the same German, seabold. Uh, collecting plants in Japan. Okay. Well, on to uh, the lady slipper that's so pretty. This is a little bit of a trek, but uh, we'll take our time. This is a big mass of a, one cultivar of Calanthe called Golden Treasure, and it was the brightest yellow without being gold, sort of like bright daffodil or forsythia yellow, and about that tall in bloom and also fragrant. Um, and it was early. That's one thing I should mention. The calanthes and the blatillas, which we'll see in a little while, both tend to come into growth real early in the year, you know, at a time of, of the year when we more often than not still have a frost. So it it is important to, hey Alicia, it's important to um, protect that new growth if we're going to go below freezing um, because the foliage, um, especially on the blatillas, if they get damaged, well it's going to be damaged the rest of the year because if frost cut off this foliage on either one of them, they're not going to put up new growth until next year. Um, and you know, more often it doesn't get totally killed away. Um, but, you know, because we did protect it, this year's foliage looks nice and clean and will look good all um, summer long. You can see, we, again, we didn't get last year's cut off and you can see it's starting to look shabby. And how did you protect it? Uh, frost cloth. Cloth, okay. Yeah. Um, lots of little bamboo stakes making little tents over tents. things. It took us <laughs> most of a day to go through all the gardens and protect things. Um, wow. Fortunately, well, I'm knocking on wood because it's been crazy cool lately. Yeah. Um, uh, fortunately, we only had to do that once this winter. You know, there are certainly winters when you know, there are multiple light frosts.
Oh my! <laughs> a bonus plant. Um, yeah, I didn't even see it yesterday when I was looking for the lady slippers. Yeah, let me. Uh, here's a plant I didn't know we had to see today, and here's its label way up here. Uh, this is an orchid. Um, you know, it, the whole spike might not look much like an orchid, but I, th again, Liddy is will have the incriminating evidence that I've removed a flower. Um, let me put his label. Then it's uh, Cremastra appendiculata, so something's uh, an appendage or something. But I think if you um, sort of spread the petaloids, you see that does start to look a bit like an orchid. Did you, did you see it? And I think this species is Asian, but it's a close ally. Do you know our native woodland orchid um, putty root? Yes. yes. Yeah, a uh, close relative of putty root. See the foliage is much like putty root pleated leaf, but without the white stripes of putty root. Um, but putty root is fairly common in woodlands around here, not as common as um, the spotted crane fly orchid. These flowers remind me more of like a super showy spotted crane fly in their sort of translucent tan. Well, that was a treat. I didn't know we even had that to see today. Uh, this is a few steps on. We have the uh, lady slipper that's in uh, perfect right now, but and this one. Um, it's Cypripedium rascal, it's a hybrid, and you can see it, it did a good job of blooming. It's become a nice big clump. I don't know if this is one that's currently in production, but this is what I was, would expect out of um, some of the more robust hybrids. I love these uh, sepals that spiral like that. You see that in um, other lady slippers and other genera like the uh, tropical Paphiopetalums from Asia. I think the foliage, you see the foliage on the um, Cypripedium is much like the Calanthe foliage, um, but it, instead of rising right from the crown of the plant, it's up on these stems. Again, you know, a full shade area. Um, that's, that's south, so the sun will probably be a little bit brighter later on in the day. But the, we'll go and, uh, you know, look at this next Cypripedium, it's Kentuckyense. Anyone guess where that occurs? Uh, yeah. Kentucky? Yeah. Whenever you see that E-N-S-E ending of a word, it indicates um, from, you know, like Chinensis, um, Raleighensis. Um, but Cypripedium Kentuckyense does occur uh, in a wider area than, um, <laughs> oh, stuck. yeah, than, um, just Kentucky, and it's one that's easy to grow. And it's done something that they'll do when they're growing robustly. It can have more than one flower on escape. Mm -hmm. It's a great beauty, and it's big and showy. Mm -hmm. That's I don't currently have a garden of my own, but that's one I would definitely grow in a shade garden. So handsome. I, here's some... No, that's the truly. Yeah, this is Calanthes seaboldii, and you you know it's well past its peak, but you see it's a nice bright yellow. That golden treasure, the hybrid over there, um, is you know twice as bright a yellow as this. But seaboldii is a big showy thing. You can see, you know, that scape. That's maybe almost a foot tall. Now when. People are starting out with hardy orchids. It's uh, often this one they start with. It's also the one you know, that'll show up in almost any garden center. Uh, the other ones are more something you find in a special, specialist nursery. But this is a blatilla. Um, the genus blatilla is small. There's only five species. This is blatilla striata. I'm probably referring to the, you know, the striations in the leaf. Um, this is a location where it's not in sun all day, but it does have some hours of sun. And we have found that even though 
they will grow well. Well, they will grow all right. They'll survive in a, a you know full shade area. They actually will flower a lot more um, with several hours of sun. Um, Latillus triata is a spring bloomer. It's almost done now. Um, and, and there, this one has, I think this is the cultivar Yokohama. No, I don't see the label right now, but it has a slight white margin to it. There's other cultivars with um, much more variegation. Gotemba stripes is about half white, half green stripes. Um, the uh, blatillas I'm real um, excited about are some of the other species and the hybrids because they're just starting to bloom now but they will bloom for months. Some of them will bloom all summer. And there's quite a few listed in the catalog. And whereas this is the typical height of Blatilla striata in bloom, the uh, things like Ocracia, which means becoming yellow, um, or Formosana, you know, though eventually the scape will be three, sometimes almost four feet tall. So th those are really worthwhile because you'll get months of bloom out of them. Um, and there's a bunch of hybrids between them, and they come in a wider range of color. Blatilla striata, this is the typical color, can also be white or white with a purple lip, but um, uh, the hybrids can be yellow and uh, other colors as well. So they're, they're really, um, th those are really exciting ones, um, partly because they, they bloom for so long. Now, uh, you could dig this plant up and divide it into individual stems, but uh, the way they so they have a rhizome underground that's jointed. In the orchid world, it's referred to as the pseudo bulbs. It's not a technically a true bulb. Um, let me step into the sunlight. Um, do you see this rounded part here? It's about uh, you know about the size of a nickel or something. Well, when you, when you dig these up, you'll have the lead bulb, which is this year's growth, and like a whole series of these pseudobulbs, sort of like a atabede. I, well, this crowd probably know, knew atabedes. I don't know if young people know what atabedes are. Um, my, you know, I had two older sisters, and of course my mom, and they're atabedes. But you could just divide a clump like this into individual stems with a long piece of rhizome. But if you separate these pseudobulbs into separate pieces, and that's what was done here, um, each one of those will put up new growth. Yeah, so when you, when you dig the latilla up and you divide it into these separate um, pseudobulbs, each one of those will put up new growth. Um, whereas in nature, they're just hanging out until they're needed and they might not ever be needed. And you know, and each one of these represents one year. So that was last year's, that was two years ago, that was three years ago. You know, eventually they die of old age probably, but they're just, uh, you know, the backup reserve if something happened to the lead plant. So when we divide them, we're um, essentially creating that situation where they're now needed and they will put up new growth. And you can do the same thing with the calanthes. Um, where when you dig them up, you'll, you'll have these, probably not quite as pronounced, but instead of just dividing it so you have the, the stem with foliage, you can divide those older parts that um, don't have any foliage any now because they're several years old. And that way, when you divide them, you can produce that many more plants. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Really interesting. yeah. Well, and it's like, you know, a lot of things with rhizomes like um, cannas and ginger lilies and stuff like that. I know I always thought you, you needed that lead, you needed this new stem, but actually when I did a little potting demonstration, I had this overgrown pot of a ginger lily and I wanted to show how, you know, a, a rhizome is an underground stem, so there's buds on it. And when I chopped that into maybe like two inch pieces, it was actually the, the back pieces, not the one with the lead to put up the most shoots because the lead piece is just going to put up one shoot, but on something like a ginger or a canna, the part of the rhizome without that lead, all those buds along the rhizome are going to grow. So whereas the lead tended to just continue growing at that point, the back parts 
put up multiple stems. So, you know, when you're propagating, you know, don't plants want to grow, so even when you chop them up, generally each piece is going to grow. Um, this is uh, Blatillas at the edge of the bog. They don't need a wet spot. They like moisture, but just average moisture will also suit them well. Um, they're very adaptable as to soil conditions. I'd avoid soggy, but anything from average moisture to uh, moist. Um, they wouldn't thrive in a dry spot. But in the bog, there's another orchid um, that's quite easy to grow if you have a bog, if you like growing pitcher plants and stuff. Or um, and there's more pitcher plants over here. Uh, the little grass pink, Calopogon, mm -hmm. is quite easy. Um, you know, if you're doing well with pitcher plants, then you have the right conditions for uh, Calopogon. Um, there's also several ladies' tresses, which are sp Spiranthes. The one that's been sold as Chad's Ford um, is real vigorous. It doesn't bloom until maybe September, October, but spikes of little white flowers. And Spiranthes mean spiral flower because the flowers on some of them are arranged sort of in a spiral up the spike. But there's a little uh, spring blooming one that uh, um, is also easy to grow. That's about all I have to say, talk about it with orchids, but I'm happy to entertain questions or anything. Um, there, um, you know, in a cold climate, like cold, in, you know, relative to like the tropical, the tropics where so many orchids are native, in a cold climate like this, um, there's basically no epiphytic orchids that survive our winter and the epiphytes are the orchids that grow up on the limbs of trees and stuff. There is one that you can encounter um, down on the coast. Um, it's a dendrobium and we do have a plant in the, um, you see those yellow foliage dawn redwoods, tallest tree in the distance, there's an LA, there's a one on, on one of those trees but it's not something I would expect to succeed long term in a cold climate like that. So the orchids that survive our, our winters reliably are all terrestrial ones, ones that you know, grow down in the dirt. Questions on any of that? Okay. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. You know, if start off with platillas and calanthes and you know as i said if you can grow hostas and stuff you have the right conditions for them if you feel a little bit more adventurous and then try some of the uh, lady slippers all right well thank you very much appreciate you coming out